All right. Well, I think while Alex is figuring <laughs> other location, we can kick things off. Um, welcome everyone to the <laughs> Ask the Exports panel for data privacy and governance. Um, we have a bunch of great speakers here with us today. Uh, my name is Anisha Stana. Um, I'm a software engineer working on the Open Data Hub, and I'm, I'm just here to moderate the panel. Yeah. Mike, could you give a quick intro? <laughs> Yeah, sure. My name is Mike Bussell. Uh, I'm part of the Office of the CTO at Red Hat, um, and uh, I am uh, have the title Chief Security Architect, whatever that means. Uh, and I'm also a co-founder of the NLX project, which is uh, using trust execution environments for sensitive workloads and data and stuff like that. Very cool. Uh, Jamie? Hi, I'm Jamie. I um, lead the data governance policy here at Red Hat mm -hmm. and um, have a lot of passion around and experience with customer data security protection and privacy. So um, I look forward to your questions. Absolutely. Uh, are there? Sure. Thanks, Anish. Hey, folks. Uh, Uday Bapana, Product Manager for uh, Data Services, AI, and Machine Learning Infrastructure at Red Hat. Also been involved a lot in the Open Data Hub uh, since inception, trying to figure out uh, the data mm -hmm. services and the privacy and security aspects of it. Okay. Uh, this was the bit where I was going to ask Alex to introduce himself, but he just <laughs> disconnected. Um, well, I, I guess I can introduce him. Alex is technically my boss, so <laughs> um, he is yeah one of the managers for the um, Open Data Hub team uh, at Red Hat, and he's responsible primarily for running it. Oh, there you go. I'll let you do that, Alex. <laughs> Who are you, and what do you do? For, for, for the introduction, let me know if my internet starts to drop. I've just moved into a new house, and right now I'm at my in-laws who have bad internet because my new house doesn't have internet yet. <laughs> um, like Anish said, I am I at Red Hat. I am a, uh, a manager on Red Hat's internal data hub team. If you're familiar with the Open Data Hub project, uh, well, I guess if you're not familiar with the Open Data Hub project, it is a, a platform for doing uh, data science, machine learning type things on OpenShift. And my team, we run an instance of that Open Data Hub here at Red Hat um, to enable teams at Red Hat to use the Open Data Hub to do data science type workloads. Um, and as part of that, we own, or well, we, we, we own a platform that stores and, and manages a, a pretty large amount of data. And we have plenty of challenges around that, uh, sharing that, that data with various different teams. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'll kick things off then with some shared. Um, Jamie, uh, would you mind telling us a little bit more about what a day is like in your life? What are some of the operational things you need to worry about? You know, all that fun stuff. All the amazing things that um, everyone is always interested in. Um, <laughs> so for me, it's, it's, you know, I start my day, you know, looking at the news really to see what's happening in the privacy space, right? You know, you see changes every day. Um, you have Privacy Shield, you have the Brazil um, privacy law, you have, I, yesterday I saw something from Washington State, um, you know, privacy um, has is making its way through the headlines on a daily basis. So, you know, kind of, you know, trying to think what are our customers going to be asking? What are the requirements? You know, what type of approach are we going to take? What are the guardrails that we can put in place? What are the business controls from an operational standpoint or technical standpoint? Um, you know, those are the things that I really think about um, on a daily basis and how we can always improve, right? So as things change, that gives us an opportunity to improve the process and, and the experience as well. All right, all right, thank you. Um... So sort of trying to leave, leave from that. Um, how, so there, there's a lot of open source projects within the space, right? Like for data security, you have things like Open API, oh, Open Policy Agent. Um, the previous presentation talked about Open SCAP. Then you have like Enarx, Data Mesh, Egeria. How do you sort of see those fitting into like this bigger picture of protecting data, right? Both within Red Hat or at, you know, in the industry as a whole? So uh, I can kick that off, Anish. Yes, so there are a, a series of new open source projects that have been incubated over the last two, three years, specifically on, on the data privacy and security aspect. And 
what, these projects are good in that they are following uh, the the path laid out to the original database sort of a workload, right? You still have lots of unstructured data, but the the policy, the security, the governance models, and law and, and the requirements haven't changed. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a good amount of open source projects come up around those areas. The, the next step of evolution in what I see uh, based on interacting with these communities is the need to put these projects together into a, a true solution. Right now, there's some good projects solving a really good problems but we need a way to connect them together. We need standards or, or standard interfaces to connect all of these together. So you get that uh, security and privacy requirements, but also the end user and the admin and, and the chief data officer experience that they desire. So do you think companies are ready to start adopting some of these open source tools for security and data governance? Or do you think like the push is still towards some of the larger common offerings um, commercial closed source offerings. So I, I'm going to come to it from a slightly different direction. Um, so I'm, I'm more, my interest is more on some of the lower level tech that can support some of this, these capabilities. And I think we are definitely seeing a world where companies are getting wise to the fact, not just companies, you know, large organizations are getting wise to the fact that open source means that it's auditable. It means that, you know, you've got to be aware of the many eyes hypothesis where thing open is just better because more people look at it because security isn't like that. You need trained, good people uh, who are experts looking at it in a, in a structured way. But when you have, you know, companies such as Red Hat or, you know, many companies out, out there you know, supporting open source uh, and security related uh, products or projects, um, and making sure that though you do have expertise, I think that people are beginning to realize from the bottom up, at least, that actually there's a lot of benefit to that. It, you, and what's more, you know, if someone, if you don't need to have multiple people, multiple organizations auditing a, a, a project from different points of view, they can all, it can all be done once. Um, and there's some interesting things going on in the in the world out there about supply chain uh, and how you manage that in the open source world, etc. But at least it's open. At least you can see it. And I think that you know companies are, are realizing that certainly from the bottom up. Now I can't talk to some of these the, the sort of higher level constructs that are being put together about that. Other folks on the call can, but I would be surprised if that doesn't start happening uh, as if it hasn't already, uh, frankly. So, so to, to add to what Mike said, uh, this uh, what what, uh, f what we're looking seeing in open source is a lot of these good technologies being developed, right? Uh, but as I look at it from the community and the community composition perspective, this is a great area and a chance to bring the non-technical folks into open source, to bring the auditors, to bring the lawyers, to bring the legal folks, getting the right thing in security and privacy, and, and that domain needs a lot more expertise than just technical uh, experience or documentation, right? We need the domain knowledge and we need to expand the scope of these open source communities to include those uh, knowledge experts that can help the communities uh, in the end produce the right project and product. I think that's where we have a big uh, step to, to, to go next. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I, I, it worries me whenever we have any project which doesn't look just beyond the techies, well, for pretty much anything, but particularly where you're in a world of compliance and auditing and things, you absolutely need to have have that involvement. And as you say, in open source, there's a great opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, any, anyone have any ideas about how to encourage that? So... Now my team, the, the open data team, um, you know, and I, I absolutely echo what you guys have been saying. When we've been able to get people, just you know, my team, which is purely technical, involved in these sorts of discussions, uh, we've we've been able to see really great progress. You know, it's just, if nothing more than identifying requirements and use cases for what we need as coming. Our background is not purely managing data and building out big enterprise level systems for that. We don't have necessarily the years of expertise around that. I've done a really good job, um, at least within the Open Data Hub community, seeking to like actively pull out that engagement or the, 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 those 
uh, engagements, those community members, right? So, so Mike, to your question, how do you get people involved? Um, I think you have to be really deliberate in, in inviting people to come and, and, mm -hmm. and asking them to come. I think we've found, you know, and certainly across all the open, open source communities we've been in, people are really eager to help. They just want to know, they need to know what to help with, right? I think being very deliberate and intentional with, um, you know, keeping your eyes open for people who have expert, have these expertise you're looking for and inviting them to community meetings, inviting them to present with your team, inviting them to collaborate and being about, we need your expert on, you know, what three requirements do people have, need to have for data governance, right? You know, give them something specific to help with. And I think people mm -hmm. are, are eager to help. Yep. Yeah. And, and to what Alex said, uh, the other one thing also that's different in here is, is it's also more cultural in that open source communities have traditionally been looked at as areas for incubating great technology, right? But we need to front end some of that with the classic, like you said, the closed source offering processes where we have wireframes or mockups that we can bring these non-technical folks into, but still get some really good feedback, make sure they understand and we understand the requirements. A question. Uh, yeah. Um, so Sherrod Griffin um, was asking. So I guess in that same way, uh, many of the protection laws that have been put out there are vague policies and processes. Are you seeing anything being done from the open source communities to help bridge government policies with practical usage of being able to execute on these? I think an example here would be the foundational pieces that you know you're following for you know something like the GDPR, right? So I mean that's something that would be foundational from like a privacy by design, security by design lens, right? Um, and then you would then you know create your own processes and guidelines and policies around how you're interpreting that, right, and following that, and how you can go back and audit it and um, basically you know verify and, and improve as you go along right so um i don't have any specific examples but i think that is you know the, a guiding principle that you know you would as an example for a gdpr so i'm i'm aware of one um which is being talked about at the moment um so um i talked about the nrx project that's part of a um a linux foundation project called uh the confidential computing consortium which is about using trusted execution environments to, to protect uh, data in use. So um, we're already thinking about whether we should be engaging with standards bodies to say, you know, GDPR says you're only allowed to keep stuff, well, I, I'm oversimplifying it. Let's say some of these things say you have to have things encrypted at all times if they're outside a particular jurisdiction. Is it acceptable to say, as long as it's encrypted in this hardware controlled um, and audited um, manner to be running stuff. So I could, let's say, process um, data in this protected way because it's always encrypted from the rest of the host um, in a different jurisdiction. Uh, and I think there, HIPAA, uh, there's some other things around there about we've got these new technical controls. Um, can we apply them in ways uh, that would allow that meet the meet the spirit of the law or the spirit of the regulations where frankly the the letter is not clear um, and I think there's some opportunities arising in a number of areas there actually that's just one that I happen to be a big bit very interesting yeah. Really never thought about it from that perspective, you know. Thanks for that. Um, taking a step back from open source, um, what are cha some challenges that we generally see our customers facing with requests regarding data security and privacy? So what? what... Yes, yeah, I think, you know, for our customers, they, they think obviously it's, you know, data breach. I mean, that's that's brand, that's reputation, that's money, that's fines, all the things, right? Liability. Um, you know, they are looking to see, you know, how what you know certifications you have. You know, they're looking to see how you, um, you know, how are you? What are your controls for how you implemented, you know, something in the privacy or security space? You know, what are you doing 
in these areas. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions that we get asked, but you know, those things, you know, help us to understand, you know, the new requirements coming down, right? So you asked me what was top of mind of my everyday is always making sure that I'm up to date on what's happening in the world because we are going to get a question from our customers asking, hey, I just saw this, what are you guys doing about it, right? So, you know, really just making sure that we are, you know, we acknowledge that we, um, you know, are following and, you know, understand that we, you know, we are implementing, you know, as we kind of go along as well as things, you know, change so quickly. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, so from my uh, role of talking to our customers and, and trying to understand uh, across the management chain and, and, and what the challenges are, one thing that always keeps pops up is trying to balance this idea of security and privacy and compliance with keeping the data set meaningful enough to do something useful with it, right? You can't anonymize every element of a data set and then make it useful. You have to find that right balance. And then the other key challenge that goes with it is it's also about automating that process of solving the challenge, right? Even if we know how to sanitize a data set, are there tools, are there uh, projects out there that can automate it because a human being can only look at so many lines of our data sets and anonymize it manually, right? Is, is there a standardization process that can be done? Like here is a standard process for anonymizing a medical image. Here is what you do if it's payroll data, right? The, the, the missing link there is, is, is that there aren't many projects or uh, software or solutions in that area too. Yeah, that, that's a problem space that we work in a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I'm worried. Or let me know if it is, but uh, my team is in is we own a kind of a general purpose data lake here at Red Hat, right? So we have countless numbers of discrete data sources in our system added every day, mm -hmm. right? Um, for us to be able to manually audit that entire data set and know, you know, what has information in it, what needs to have restricted access, et cetera, we could never try and scale to do that all on our own. So looking for open source tools that will let us automate the process is, is key. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're fortunate to have some, some great partners here in the office of the CTO at Red Hat, or, you know, building AI ops types type pipelines where, you know, we try and do things like automate scanning of data to identify what needs to be masked. Um, you know, that's a, a, a big kind of area where we see a lot of potential there to, to be able to scale out. Yeah. Um, so I, I was lucky enough to be able to take part in a Red Hat Research Day uh, earlier this week, uh, where this this came up specifically. I've just put the link actually in the uh, in the chat. Um, at the uh, the session sh were recorded and should be available to to watch soon. Uh, but there's some really interesting academic work going on, some of which is beginning to bleed through. I'm sure that you know, Alex and folks are aware of this, um, and we have some interesting links with uh, Harvard and uh, Boston University and folks. Uh, people who are working uh, on a sort of area. I just thought it might be interesting for people to uh, have a look around there. Really complex stuff, it turns out, and really interesting too. But mm -hmm. it looks like some of the stuff is be beginning to, to bleed through into real world use cases, which is fantastic. So I guess may this may be a loaded question, but um, are you starting to see some engagements between like these academic research things and like open source communities in the space? Or do you foresee that being something that should be happening? One very specific example uh, of a uh, of a corpus that's being put together um, for that is called Open DP, Open Differential Privacy or Privacy, if you're a, if you're a Brit like me, um, which is trying to bring together some of those tools uh, and make make them open source the algorithms, the tools, the uh, the, the the frameworks as well. <clears throat> I think it's a um, an area where academics are realizing that actually it's a great way to get some visibility is to go more open source. Um, I again, I'm not hugely um, uh, in a great position to talk about this. I just watch the talks and I'm passing on what I what I found. It really interesting. I heartily recommend that anyone uh, who's interested. Yeah, uh, we've got some more questions. People keep asking questions. That awkward. Yeah, it's uh. <laughs> a good thing, right? <laughs> They're engaged. So Ricardo asked, um, with the growing number of privacy laws uh, in the world, how can a company adhere to all of these laws? What guidance should they be looking for? 
Yeah, that is um, a great question. And I think the, the GDPR bar was so, is that like foundational, you know, um, really made us think about privacy in a totally different way than we ever have, right? And it, and it, a lot of companies took a global approach. Red Hat has taken a global approach. So when you take that global approach, it makes it a lot easier to then adjust to the Brazil law as an example, because it's kind of a copy of the GDPR. Yes, there's some differences, but it's it's there's a lot of similarities in how you would implement it, right? And the ones that really get tricky are the ones that are, um, you know, the ones that are on top of like the GDPR and the ones that are state specific in North America, as an example, you know, there's so many different nuances that you have to follow. So if you take like the, the you know, the the highest bar and you say, okay, we're gonna take the global approach that it's, you cast such a wide net that you can then, you know, be able to move with the changes rather than, and, and be more proactive um, versus a reactive mode. And you also have um, some time, right, to implement um, based on when things kind of go in, in effect and, and how you're enforcing. Mm -hmm. So, Jamie, a quick follow-up question then to that is, uh, I mean, this, what you said seems pretty similar to what we see in the tax law side of the world, right? Every county, state, a country has a completely different way of doing things or that may not fit together, but that has been to a certain extent automated with the talk softwares and such, right? So do you foresee something like that being possible in, 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 in the security and privacy area and then would open source be a good area so we can all have a common code base to build upon? What do you think of it? Yeah, no, I think it'd be great. I'm always looking for open source um, solutions with, you know, compliance and I just would love to see more of it. I think this is a space, it's a huge opportunity where even in the commercial space, you don't really see a good solution, right? They're all kind of the same. They're not really, they don't really fulfill all the requirements. Um, so, I mean, I would love to kind of, you know, see an open source version that would help on a global level, right? Someone who can, you know, at something that would encompass, you know, everywhere, that we can kind of put it together and, and put the similarities together so you can see it holistically, mm -hmm. right? Um, and not be so, you know, region specific, if you will. But yeah, I think it's a great opportunity and there's a lot out there to kind of, you know, kick off. Interesting. So, I, well, speaking of that then, right? Like, do you see intelligent automation of all of this stuff being very um, important, right? Like since with all the data growing, it's just growing, right? More and more companies you keep sending more data. You have more data centers everywhere. Um, I think, well, I say I think. What do you think of like <laughs> building out open source systems with this automation built in from the get go, right? Versus sort of trying to go back and apply some ML principles to it. Yeah, and I think that goes back to the principle of just treating data as an asset. Right. I think, you know, we really have to look at it in that way. And um, and then the rules kind of are like the guardrails to kind of ensure that you're moving that forward. But, yeah, I, there's no way that we could do this manually <laughs> at all. And we shouldn't be doing it manually in 2020. Right. So I think you definitely you need those technical um, business controls and policies um, to, to safeguard, you know, you along the way. Yeah, to, to echo. I, I like automation is going to be required what i think will be interesting to see is automation gets pushed out to like the the edge to use an overloaded term of where the data gets generated right it seems like trying to do all this automation on a central data lake um would just entail these massive batch jobs that would take forever because of how much data they have to operate on which you know might not produce the best results or at least add some latency, right? Can we push can we push that automation out closer to the, the source of the data to know as data is coming in, um, you know, flag, identify whatever sensitive data gets generated, do whatever masking we can, or at least, you know, flag it for future processing kind of thing. I, I think that will be an interesting space to see what happens. That was, again, something mm -hmm. that came up in, on the research day that was talked about a bit. There's some interesting things. Um, going on there, it's worth worth finding out about. I, I try not to sound like an expert because I'm really not. Um, <laughs> but, uh... Very cool. Um, so we've been talking a lot, lot about um, GDPR and CCPA. I right? you know like 
not quite specifically, but sort of dancing around those questions. Um, what have you seen for your customers who are already using open source products, right? And it doesn't have to be products for data compliance or data security, but just, you know, general usage of open source products. How is it affecting their day to day with sort of their workflows and, you know, going more specific, how is it affecting what they try to do with AI and machine learning? I think um, GDPR is your individual right to privacy and your California Consumer Privacy Act is really focused on the consumer, right? And kind of protecting um, a specific demographic, right? For their right to privacy. Um, I think, um, you know, there's, we need to find a, a better way to automate. I think that's been like the theme here, right? You know, for sure is, it's something that we need to do, but understanding the difference between the two, right, is that um, that they all kind of mesh together, right? Um, I think that um, just the requirements, um, we need to make it easier just to audit right? and to make sure that those business controls are the ones and technical controls are the right ones and, and that we can adjust along the way. So, so, yeah, so uh, from uh, people, uh, customers using open source, uh, uh, the feedback has been good. So they, 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 they see a project that's open, so they they can go look at the code and figure out and make sure it does exactly what it does. And there's no Trojan horses hidden inside or no loopholes, right? So the, the place where open source helps is uh, for security and privacy is you don't just get to control your data on paper. You can have you or a friend look at the code and say that it really controls and does the right thing, right? So that's where we're seeing a lot of positive feedback and then good vibes on the open source side. Uh, the, the areas I think we need to still work on on the open source aspect is one, make sure we put like uh, you, the right usability framework around it, right? Most of these tools in the end are supposed to cater to a non-technical audience, highly technical in their fields, like the legal and the auditing field, but not technical in the computer science sense of the world, right? So we need to make sure we make these tools applicable and, and easy enough uh, to their workflows and, and to their usability standards. That, that's where I think uh, we, we have a gap that we need to close fast. And then comes, uh, this is where the commercial aspect of open source comes, right? We have a solution, but there's also uh, the, the legal certifications that we have to go through, these agencies that we have to go and run their test feeds or have them look through the code and certify that the tool is the right tool to use. And that is where some of the commercial vendors dealing in open source can really help uh, because they already have staff that can do that or have had those relationships in the past. So that's another area where uh, we can really help out. So to kind of harp a little bit on the technical uh, usage aspect, Alex, have you have you seen any problems with this internally, right? Since you manage a big data lake, kind of, do you have any thoughts to share here? I think I think the biggest challenge we have is there are all these open source tools in this space, right? There are all these different places where you might store data. For us, it's Elasticsearch and Kafka and S3, right? And there's all these different tools that process data, and there's all these different tools that people use to analyze data. And in the past, um, I think, you know, there were a few big players in the space that so it was easier to build a solution that worked for that one big player. But today people want to use one of N different tools. They want to be able to pick the, the best of breed that's to the best of breed of what's available to them. And so from an, an auditing and security side, it has to work with everything and do its job really well with everything. That's that's the challenge we're really trying to overcome. And so that's that's honestly what has made progress a little slow for us. Um, you know, trying to figure out what is what is the the lowest hanging fruit or the the highest priority thing to try and try and tackle in the security space or, or in a solution to build with these open source tools. Well, it's like you could read my mind. You just set up my next question <laughs> to some extent. Um, so we're talking about all this like transitions in technology, right? Um, and like the, these different paradigms where you have a lot of these different tools coming in, um, good, whether this might be for you. Um, how do you think the evolution of like how we store and access this data has effect, affected these, um, the tools organizations are using? You know? um, I 
that um, certainly with with GDPR, you know, adding constraints on where data can be stored, um, it it forced people to be more flexible in how they ran. So previously, when when like you know corporations controlled all the data and could decide you know where to run the data, whatever is easiest for them, um, they didn't necessarily have to like worry about all the added complexity they just do whatever is easy for them pick the best product and just run it right for us having to be able to build a solution that works across all of you know the whatever whatever cloud provider you pick in the world whatever country you pick in the world whatever on-prem thing you pick in the world um has kind of i guess maybe not leveled the playing field but forced us to to build better solutions mm -hmm. that, that work across a wider range of use cases. Yeah. And I think there's a couple of things also going on that are, are forcing the trend, Alex, right? There's one, it's just uh, the classic, the volume and scale of data, right? Organizations are now, now starting to think, how do we manage this data at the largest scale that we have them? It isn't a, a data warehouse or controlled by a vendor anymore, right? You have a lot of data coming in. So how do we apply these policies at scale and how do we scale out the tools and the processes to support it? And the second one is just the amount of data coming in, right? In the past, when you had structured data warehouses and databases, you had data coming in a very structured format. You knew exactly where, where it was going in, in a table or a column. You don't anymore, right? It could go anywhere from a text file to CSV to whatever image uh, user uploads. Now, just the variety of data has grown so much that they are realizing it isn't a single tool that can solve it. You have to have uh, multiple tools that and then have to collaborate to make a solution happen. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> we answered quite a few of the questions. I think you pretty much ran through most of the ones I prepared. <laughs> I had a question which, uh, which I was thinking about, which is we hear a lot about, um, you know, your, your, your CFO or your COO or your chief risk officer or whatever um, getting involved because there's now liability at the board level. Um, for you know for making sure that your data governance is is managed how much um do we do we think that they they care about the technology obviously they want things mm -hmm. automated are we seeing pressure from that direction at all do they care about open source do you see what i mean because often you'd expect that decisions around this sort of thing to be a to be a level down but if the board really cares how how much they're getting involved is that something anyone can can talk about I have no idea. I know that um, at some of the at some companies, it is at the board level. It is on the P and L level, right, where they're tracking it as well. Um, I'm not sure the what the connection to the the open source is, right? But it is. I know something that it's becoming more and more aware. And I think, Mike, you bring up a really good point because I think with the with now COVID. I think privacy and security is at the forefront of everyone's mind, right? Everyone is going to the doctor, right? Whether you want to or not, you hear about it, you know, well, you know, how are they going to track to make sure that I'm six feet away from someone or how, what, how is my information going to be protected and what are they going to do with this analysis now if I got tested, right? So I think that everything is just really starting to bubble up. And I think Privacy got kind of a wave with GDPR three years ago, and now you're on this wave now with with COVID, right? With hey, it's even more important now, and you know, so important that you know individual states within the U.S. are now considering, you know, okay, well, what do we want to think about with HIPAA? Do we want to put that with you know some components of that with CCPA, or do we want to put components of that with something else? It's a different conversation, right, than it ever has been before. And I think until you see enforcement in that area, it won't become real, right? But I know that some companies are putting on their PL. Mm -hmm. and, and Mike, again, it's, it's a discussion point, like you said. I don't think we have an answer, but uh, do they care for the technology part? Do they care? I think it's it's not about the technology pieces they care, but 
in my view, being open source gives you an extra level of uh, security, right? That you have the multiple eyes looking at thing uh, at that same code base. Which certainly, if you are a board member, you would rather have something that's been widely accepted that your peers have uh, accepted and looked at. So that aspect is where I think open source is at the top of the mind, all the way up to the CXO level or even the board level. Is that multiple eyes issue, right? And and the second area where open source is uh, up to their mind is it's just extending it is easy right if you have a specific use case in your company because you're in a slightly differently regulated industry it's easy to get pulled on an open source project and add stuff in there to suit your industry it's not so easy for a proprietary software i think that's where also boards do is i mean boards and and cxos look at m and a for an year or two down the lane they plan for strategy right and and the tools need to support those m and a operations or extensions uh, easy enough and i think that's where open source is gaining mind share Interesting. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned COVID, uh, Jamie. There was a uh, a case uh, last week or so where eighteen thousand COVID patients, all of the COVID positive patients in Wales, which is part of the UK, uh, PII personally identifiable, inform identifiable information was was released by accident as a big breach. Uh, and you know that the thing about that is, of course, those they may have other underlying health conditions. They may have other you know genetic or, or other um, other conditions or other information which is unrelated to COVID but is now being released as well and you know it, it really does bring it to the fore you're right we we need to be thinking about these things and it's not just companies it's governments it's 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 charities um, I'm, I'm aware of an organization and not not uh, anything to do with with Red Hat I should point out where they had a they have a whistleblowing policy and um, uh, they all good stuff, and uh, someone was searching for the um, the whistleblowing policy on their internal intranet, and found not only the policy but all the cases of whistleblowing with all of the information and all of the details of of how it had been managed. And that is the sort of thing you really don't want to be happening, <laughs> right? And it's these are very different types of cases, but they're they're what we should be worrying us. Mm -hmm. um and, and which i hope folks like you can can sort out yeah that'd be great <laughs> no, so so mike i think you bring an interesting topic that the uh, direction that we can take the conversation is uh so till now we've been focused on the front end right how do we make sure we respect the security laws the privacy aspects and the privacy wishes of individuals but you bring up a good point so what about post breach i mean these things happen as we have seen right so once there is a breach once things get out what are some things we could do, both from the the, the 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 software automation aspect of it, and even from the process side, to to contain the amount of uh, damage that's happening? Or how can we contain the blast radius once there's a breach? One of the most um, criteria that we sorry, the one of the most important criteria that we focus on in building out solutions is auditability, right? When when a breach has happened, you need to know what has happened and what this the scope mm -hmm. is that's that's kind of box number one that we're trying to check is with with the solution we're building together with all these tools how can we know who accessed what data when yeah and this is this is tricky stuff i i don't have you know we don't have ways to wipe people's memories or or wipe all the machines that things have gone to i'm kind of pleased to say i guess um i think there are some um techniques from cryptography and uh, the world of sort of certificate management around revocation that we should be thinking about. You know, what can we revoke? Are there, can we, it, it doesn't stop things being uh, exposed, but if you can revoke access or you can, um, you can make it clear that, thing, uh, that things are not um, certified or whatever, it's, it's really hard. Um, but I think we, we need to think about some of these time specific capabilities. Maybe, you know, we should be removing data. You know, these days we want to keep data for as long as possible. But there are occasions actually when removing and deleting data is the right thing to do. Um, uh, you know, and just because we've got the space to keep it doesn't mean we should. Yeah. And I think understanding the why. Right. I mean, breaches happen because it's human error most of the time. Right. And just understanding, you know, why why did that happen right and why did why was that a good idea at the time because what it may have been a good idea three years ago is not a good idea today right um and i think you know just being um 
just the trust and transparency, right? Making sure that you are, you know, saying, hey, this is what we're doing. This is, you know, these are the steps that we're following. And I think that goes a long way of rebuilding your brand and relationships, because that really is, is what it, it, it comes down to is how are you going to be that trusted partner, um, you know, once this does happen and customers then have the assurances that, hey, hey, they do have those controls in place. I feel good about it. Um, you know, this is how we kind of all came together and move forward. So I think, you know, that's that's the other side of it. Mm-hmm. So that uh, raises another question, maybe we don't have much time, which is that are, are consumers getting blasé? Are they getting, oh, stuff leaks all the time. Should they be more worried about leaks? Yeah, I mean, especially with your COVID example, right? I mean, I can't imagine just from a discrimination standpoint or all the things that could happen with that, right? I just, you know, I think people do care. I think it does matter. It is. Is this, it is in the news, right, daily. And I think it does impact consumers' choices as well, right? It's the, the whole trust thing, right? Am I going to really want to do business with a company that just exposed my credit card? Probably not, right? Um, you know, especially if I hear that it's a repeat, right, breach, you know, yeah. that's where I think it becomes really um, a bad situation. The thing that excites me about open source is I think it's creating those choices for people. You know, people don't want to feel like they're locked in. They they don't trust somebody, but there's no alternative. I think with open source, we're creating alternatives. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was an interesting, interesting discussion here, uh, folks. Uh, thanks for your time. Um, we have like a minute or two left. Um, but we, I mean, I'm fine with calling it right now. Just as a, just as a general announcement for everyone here, um, we have, I think, roughly 35 minutes um, between, uh, well, for lunch now. Mm-hmm. So the next set of sessions will be starting around at 12.50 Eastern time, which is you know, converted to your time zone. I think schedule it, scared lets you do that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, thanks a ton, guys, for uh, hopping on to this. And, and please, please come along to uh, the session I'm uh, co-leading uh, at uh, mm-hmm. ten past five on NART, which will tell you about a very specific technology. I'll just plug that. Thanks, Anish, for uh, for leading yeah. us through. It's been fun, folks. Thanks, Good folks, to, and to thanks, Anish, for leading the discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.